Hello, health champions. What if there was a magic pill that could help you become a better and happier you? What if this magic pill could give you your ideal body, give you more energy, less disease, better mood, better sleep? And if it even could give you more confidence and help you live longer, but not just live longer, but live longer with high quality of life, how much would you be willing to pay for such a pill. My bet is that that would be the number one selling product in the world. They would sell trillions and trillions of dollars of that product. Of course, there is no such pill and there never will be. There can't be because that's not how the body works. But there is something even better. And that thing is called exercise. And that's what we're going to talk about. We really want to understand what exercise does to the body. But even though exercise can transform your life in so many ways, less than 25% of people exercise on a regular basis. And out of those people, the vast majority don't really know why they're exercising. And by that I mean they don't fully understand how critical movement is to the functioning of the body. The number one reason people exercise is for looks. And there's two things people want to change. They want to lose weight and or they want to build more muscle. Now, the funny thing is that even though the number one reason for exercise is weight loss, it doesn't really work all that well for weight loss. It can help a little bit. It can assist you in your efforts, but it's not the key factor in weight loss. Lowering insulin and changing your diet and eating more whole foods is the key factor. And of course, exercise and weightlifting works for bodybuilding if you do enough of it. And then of course, marketing comes along and reinforces this shallow understanding that it's all about weight loss. And they say that if you buy this product or this cream or this pill, then you don't even have to exercise as if that was a goal to be able to lose weight without exercise, as if exercise wasn't a goal in itself with all the benefits that it can give you. And I've even heard people say, well, why do you exercise? You're already thin. So we want to start understanding why exercise is a goal in itself, not because it can provide some way of changing how you look. It's about how the body functions. So the first thing we need to understand is the purpose of the brain is to create and manage movement. In fact, there was a Nobel Prize winner called Roger Sperry. He got a Nobel Prize for brain research. And he said that more than 90% of the energy expenditure of the brain is used in relating the physical body in a field of gravity. In other words, as you move your body around in the physical world and have gravity working on you, acting on you at the same time, that is a very complex action that uses up the vast majority of the brain's resources. And to help illustrate that, one of my favorite examples is a little creature called the sea squirt that looks something like this. And it starts out its life looking like a tadpole, as this little thing that's going to become a frog. It has one eye and one fin so that it can detect its environment and move around. It has an extremely simple nervous system comprising about 215 neurons or brain cells. And they're arranged in a way that's similar to a notochord, which is in the human embryo, when we are just after conception, when our nervous system just starts forming, we have a notochord that is basically the precursor to the spine. And this looks remarkably similar in all creatures, from the sea squirt to the tadpole to humans to basically any other vertebrate, anything that's going to have a spine eventually looks very, very similar at this stage. Now, the difference is in the creatures that are supposed to have a spine, this little notochord continues to develop into a full-blown nervous system with a spine and a spinal cord. But the sea squirt is an interesting creature in that 
its destiny is not to move around. It only gets this nervous system temporarily. So its job is to find a place to live, just like a tree or a rose bush. And once it finds that place, now it doesn't need to move. It doesn't need a nervous system to detect its environment and be able to move around. So as a result, it consumes its brain. And when it's done with that, it has zero brain cells. So let's compare a few different creatures and try to get a little more grasp on this idea. So a tree, for example, has zero brain cells and zero synapses because it doesn't need to move around to survive. It gets its nutrition right where it's standing. But anything that needs to move around to find its food needs to have a nervous system. So there is something called a ringworm. It's a very primitive, simple creature. It's about one millimeter long, and it's popular to do research on because scientists can learn a whole lot about development and neurons that way. And this little worm, pretty much like the sea squirt, it has a few hundred, it has 300 brain cells. But then it has 7,000 synapses. And synapses are where neurons connect. It's where brain cells hook up with each other. So they have strings or wires so they can signal and talk to each other. And the way that we learn things is we connect different neurons to each other and we develop different patterns. And then later on, we can learn new things by creating new patterns. Another little creature most people are probably familiar with is called a fruit fly. It has around 3,000 brain cells and about a half a million synapses. So then we take a mega leap up to the human brain, which has around 100 billion brain cells. And each human brain cell makes on average five to 10,000 connections so the possibilities are pretty much endless. We can configure these connections almost infinitely. But on any given time, a human would have somewhere around a thousand trillion synapses, which is about 10 to the 15th. So I've used the C squirt a few times before as an example. And in some of those videos, I've said things that don't move don't have a brain. And I want to qualify that a little bit and say that things that are not intended to move don't need to have a brain. But because of the way I said it, a lot of people misinterpreted that and they believe that a brain is the same thing as intelligence. So now I got about a hundred harsh comments from different viewers saying things like, well, what about Stephen Hawking? Or Stephen Hawking would disagree or are you saying that Stephen Hawking doesn't have a brain? And someone suggested that Stephen Hawking is smarter than you will ever be. And I'm not going to disagree with that in the slightest because Stephen Hawking had a very unusual, a supreme, unique intellect. And there's theories that this unique intellect helped him survive the longest that anyone has ever had Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, uh, also known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So again, the name isn't important, but what's important is that the average lifespan after diagnosis is about five years and Stephen Hawking survived for 55 years. So obviously, for humans who are designed to move, for humans who are designed to go and develop and build things and find food and develop tools to get better at finding food, we need to have a brain. And if we then lose the ability to move, it doesn't mean that we don't need a brain anymore. But what we can say is that because Stephen Hawking wasn't able to move, he gradually deteriorated more and more and more over the years. And we can also safely say that he had some severe challenges in expressing his life and his health. But the biggest reason people reacted so harshly is that as a culture, 
we believe that the brain is the same thing as intelligence, the same thing as IQ. And if we say that something doesn't have a brain, we're calling that thing stupid, which is not the case at all. So we need to understand what it means to have a strong brain and a brain that can handle everything that it's supposed to. And the thing that we call intelligence, the thing that we call focused thought, conscious thought, is about one millionth of what the brain actually does. It processes somewhere on the order of a billion bits of information every second. And then our consciousness takes little snapshots of that, of about a thousand bits per second. So I'm not saying that our intelligence resides in one millionth of the brain, but I'm saying that the conscious part that guides our intelligence is a millionth of our brain. We still need the whole brain to create all these pathways that we can learn things. But the conscious portion is about one millionth. And what does the brain really do? It manages everything about you. The brain provides you strength and muscle tone because without the brain signal feeding the muscle, it's about as strong or has about the muscle tone of a steak. Your ability to have coordination and balance is the result of the brain's orchestration of millions and millions of signals down to the millisecond to time things very, very precisely. The brain also, of course, regulates everything you don't have to think about, such as blood flow and heart rate and breath rate. But it goes even further than that because a strong, balanced brain has the ability to turn things on and turn things off to enable a good mood and attitude. Your ability to handle stress depends on the brain's ability to turn off emergency signals when there is no emergency anymore and to put things into a proper context. And we can go as far as to say that your overall ability to enjoy life, your ability to be happy, your capacity to perceive life depends on how strong and developed and balanced your brain is. So in a nutshell, we can say that the brain's purpose is its ability to process signals, to receive signals, to process signals and respond to signals. And remember, like we said, that 90% of the brain's activity, 90% of those signals that the brain processes have to do with movement. So here's how we want to think about this, that we have the brain, that receives signals first from the body and then the body, the brain, sends signals back to the body. So the brain would never know what to do with the body unless the body sent massive amounts of information. So if you can touch your nose, it's because the brain is receiving information about where this finger is relative to the nose. That's hundreds of millions of bits of information and then the brain can take that information and relate it to the changes and figure out exactly where that nose is and what the timing and speed and impact and so forth so you don't slap yourself in the face. So the signals from the body provide the brain with a picture. It's kind of like a digital monitor like your computer monitor or your TV. It has millions and millions of little pixels and together all these pixels form an image that you can perceive. If there is less pixels then the image gets blotchy or pixelated. So if the body doesn't send a correct picture to the brain then the brain doesn't understand where the body is in relation to its environment. That's called proprioception or body awareness. But the more you move, the more you're providing information to the brain, the more you're strengthening the brain. So the purpose of a muscle is to perform work. So if you go to the gym and you pump some iron, you're putting a load on the muscle. You're fulfilling the purpose of that muscle and the muscle will grow. If you do the opposite, if you hurt your arm, you put it in a cast, now 
there are very few signals. You're not putting any load on the muscle, so the muscle shrinks. But there's also very few signals because there's no movement. So now the brain starts understanding that arm, that body part, less and less. So that is how there's a continuous exchange of signals between the brain and the body. And the absolute best way to fulfill, to keep up that signal flow is exercise. And those signals, the 90% of all the signals the brain receives through exercise is the juice that keeps the brain alive, that keeps that brain strong and functional and healthy. And through all the mechanisms we talked about here, exercise also drives something called neuroplasticity, which means the brains and the nervous systems and the individual neurons ability to change, to create different connections. And this is how we learn things by creating more synapses and new synapses, information flows differently and we can adapt to our environment and we can learn new things, whether it's learning to walk or learning to drive a car or learning sign language or learning another language or learning specific skills, whatever they may be. And there is no way to learn anything new without rewiring your brain, without creating new synapses. And this is called synaptogenesis, meaning we can make new connections that involve different information, different learning. But then in order for us to create these connections, they don't happen by themselves. They are fueled by different hormones. And there's two in particular, one's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and the other is called human growth hormones. And together, these act like miracle grow for these brain synapses, in that without them, you can't make any synapses. So the number one driver, the most powerful way to make more BDNF and more growth hormone is fasting and exercise, because both fasting and exercise is a challenge to the body. When we fast, when we exercise, it's related to us moving into the world and finding more food. When we're fasting, it's more important than ever that we keep our body functioning optimally, that we're really sharp so that we can function and go find that food. And the more challenging the exercise is, the more the body is responding with these hormones, the higher the incentive for the body to adapt and change and become better. So, the higher the intensity, meaning high intensity interval training, for example, then you're making massive amounts of human growth hormone and BDNF. And I just recently learned something fascinating about BDNF. It stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So it means it mostly comes from the brain, or that's where all of it came from, we thought, until I learned recently that muscles can also make BDNF. And here I just went, wow, it's so beautiful because the muscles and the brain are so tightly connected in the relationship that we just talked about. So if the brain makes BDNF and needs BDNF, and then the muscles also assist in making BDNF when you exercise, then the signals from the muscles, the muscles are contributing, they're supporting the brain in making new synapses and adapting and learning things better. So if you take the challenge to exercise every day for 30 days, here are just a few of the things that you could expect. Increased angiogenesis in the brain. What does that mean? It means you develop more blood vessels. You increase and grow the number of physical blood vessels in the brain so that you can circulate more blood and support that brain at a higher level. You would improve your proprioception or your body awareness because just like we talked about, whenever you move, you're teaching your brain something about the body, but you're also making the brain stronger and more capable at the same time. You would lengthen your telomeres 
and telomeres are the little end caps of your DNA strands and when they're longer that makes you live longer. You can expect to improve your cholesterol health and with that I don't mean that you're going to lower your total number of cholesterol. I mean most likely you're going to increase the ratio between HDL and LDL. It's very likely your HDL will go up a little bit and your LDL will go down a little bit. But more importantly, even if both of them went up, you're going to change probably the size of your LDL particles would increase to become more healthy LDL cholesterol. You would probably improve your microbiome health and balance. The balance of all your 40 trillion bacteria in your gut. You would improve the number and the variety of healthy bacteria and you would reduce the number of pathogenic and inflammatory bacteria. And in doing that you would also affect and improve your immune function. And you can expect to improve your overall mental and physical well-being. So if you catch what I'm saying, I am basically saying that everything is likely to get better at some level because exercise affects virtually every physiological pathway and mechanism in some way and it is impossible to express optimal health, optimal physiology without movement. It doesn't mean that you can't have a good long life but it wouldn't be as good as it could have been. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.